Hello everyone, my name is Sergio Baranzini and I'm a professor of neurology at the University of California in San Francisco. And I'm gonna be talking about um, how genes and microbes shape multiple sclerosis risk. And uh, first of all, just wanna go through um, accreditation and credit designation slides. These are my disclosures learning objectives, and on to my first slide. So um, I wanna start by reminding everyone why we mean when we say multiple sclerosis is a complex disease. We understand it's complex, but in terms of uh, the, the scientific description of it, we think it's complex because it's a mix between genes and environmental risk. And the first half of my talk, I will focus on the genes, and the second half, I'll focus on the environment. So this slide uh, is a little bit intimidating, but bear with me. Uh, what it describes is the risk, lifetime risk, which you can see uh, in the x-axis, uh, as a function of genetic similarity between two individuals. So at the top right corner, you will see monozygotic twins in red. They share 100% of their genome. And the lifetime risk of a monozygotic twin who has a, 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 whose twin has MS is between 30 to 35%. And as you can see, as the risk, as the genetic similarity decreases, we go from monozygotic twin to dizygotic twins or, or siblings who share 50% of the genome. As you go down to uh, uh, parent, child, and then half sibling, aunt, nephew, so the, with the degree of similarity decreases, so does the lifetime risk of manifesting multiple sclerosis. And this decay is not linear, as you can see. And this decay is typical of genetic diseases with multiple uh, risk, genomic risk factors. And this is exactly what multiple sclerosis is. It's a genetic disease, but as you can see, even when the genome is shared at 100% in monozygotic twins, the risk is not 100%, it's 30 to 35%. So genes are incredibly important, but so is the environment. So this is what we think that where is the rest of the, 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 the risk coming from for monozygotic twins? Well, it must come from the environment and this will be the focus of the second part of the talk. But here, I wanna focus on the fact that why do we see a decrease in, um, in risk when the genetic similarity decreases? So that must point towards genes and uh, our, the genetic risk. So let me take you through a very fast paced uh, sort of movie that will describe the whole history of genetic studies in multiple sclerosis for the last 40 years and I will take about a minute and a half, so buckle up. So back in 1972, um, we knew that multiple sclerosis was an autoimmune disease, meaning that the immune system was dysregulated and that it was uh, mistakenly mounting an immune response against its own uh, organism. And in the case of multiple sclerosis, the uh, part of the body that is attacked by the immune system is the brain, is the myelin. So back in 1972, the first discovery was made that there was a genetic association between people with multiple sclerosis and the HLA, or the human leukocyte, leukocyte antigen system, or the MHC. This is the histocompatibility system that is a group of genes that encode antigens that are important to recognize what is self versus what is non-self in every organism. And it made sense that if multiple sclerosis was an autoimmune disease in which the immune system was 
conflicting whether attacking to the self or non-self, it makes sense that genes involved in this uh, discriminating system will be involved. And the way that I'm representing here um, the associations is MS is at the center, and uh, you can see my mouse here, and then every new association will be described as a little triangle. And this little concentric circles represent the strength of the association. So the closer the gene or the locus is to multiple sclerosis, the stronger that association is, the further away, the weaker the association is. So let's fast forward to 1996. This was a pivotal year because three seminal papers in top tier journals were published doing what is called a genetic linkage analysis. And what uh, those studies revealed are family-based studies in which genetic markers are analyzed in several members of the same family, and some of them with multiple sclerosis, some of them without. And typically these studies had been very successful in identifying genetic linkages with rare diseases. At the time, Huntington's disease or the shed muscular dystrophy and so on were very successful. But for complex diseases like MS, apparently they were not very uh, powerful in terms of statistics. Nothing else came out, out out of those studies. 2005, another second generation genome-wide study was done with even more genetic markers still nothing outside of the HLA region. So it really took a lot of effort and a lot of selfishness, uh, I would say. Uh, people started sharing data, starting sharing samples, and then the um, International Multiple Sclerosis Genetics Consortium was found, and labs around the world gathered together and said, well, we, this is a task bigger than any one of our labs is. Why don't we pull efforts and all together try to acquire the number of samples that will be needed to conduct a study large enough so that we can detect additional genes involved in MS. And so fruits of this consortium starting to uh, uh, blossom uh, around 2007, where the first paper was published in which the first non-HLA signals started to appear. Interleukin-7 receptor, the CD58 marker, the interleukin-2 receptor alpha, and so on. And then thanks to this consortium that enabled more and more samples to be pulled in into larger and larger studies, we started finding more and more associations. So this is in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2013. And this is the latest genome-wide association study in which more than 200 associations have been described and verified in multiple sclerosis. Still, no one as close as the HLA, which you can still see very close to MS. And this is in part why it took so many people, close to 40,000 patients, to be able to identify these associations. Nevertheless, these are extremely important to understand the underpinnings of the disease and try to develop therapies for it. But one key aspect of these type of studies is to understand so how do we go from statistics? So this genome region is associated with the disease, means statistically associated. How do we go from statistics to biology? So what does it mean that this, so what happens if you have this gene or that variant of that gene? So this brings us to the pathway analysis concept of genome-wide association studies. So this is a typical description of a GWAS in which every marker tested is sorted by their position in their chromosomes. And in the y-axis, you can see the minus log 10, base 10, of the p-value. So the higher the peak, the, the, the more significant the finding. 
And this is a typical GWAS for MS in which there's a huge peak in chromosome six and chromosome six is where that HLA system is encoded. Remember, this was the first mark, the first association discovered in MS because it's the statistically strongest. But one of the uh, key aspects of, of GWAS is that you have, because you're measuring so many markers at the same time, you're testing the same hypothesis over and over and over. So there's a chance that you will find things precisely by chance because you're testing the same hypothesis over and over. And that magic 0 0.05 uh, P value that we're all used to means that we're willing to accept 5% false positives. And if you test a million markers, well, 5% is a lot of markers. So we're not so cool with that. So there needs to be a way to control for that. And that is uh, what is called the uh, bone Ferroni correction and that kind of readjust that 0 0.05 as to make it even more stringent based on the number of hypotheses that you're testing. And in this case, it's perhaps uh, around 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight. So that means that if you remove all the signals that are below that mark, then you're only left with this. And that makes sense in order to minimize the false positives. But what about the false negatives? So things that you may be removing because they barely are underneath that magic line, but they may still be biologically relevant. So this is where the pathway analysis comes in. And this is a, a toy example of several individuals represented here by rows and different genomic uh, locations represented by the columns. And the white and black represents whether that individual at this particular position has a risk allele or the neutral allele when it's, uh, the, their DNA is tested. So you can see that if, for example, imagine that this uh, red um, highlight region here is the HLA. So at the HLA, we know that most people with MS will have the risk allele here. So you see that most of them are black. Not all of them, but most. But for other regions, it's a lot more gray zone. Not everybody has a risk allele at a particular mark, uh, marker. But this is where the biology comes in. Imagine that there's a subgroup of people. So all of these are patients. But imagine that a subgroup of them had the risk allele for this region number three here. And this encodes a protein that interacts with several other proteins in the cell. And imagine that these same individuals also have risk alleles at region 15, 24, and 33, all encoding proteins that interact in the cell. Well, so maybe the pathway is significant here, not in each individual marker, but maybe the pathway across this set of individuals. And the same situation can happen with the green pathway and the same situation can happen with the yellow pathway. So this is a, a mechanism that now biologists and bioinformaticists in, in our lab are taking to try to understand how statistically significant results can be also turned into biologically significant results. And this is a very complicated slide, but it's just, this just depicts the entire um, uh, pipeline of analysis and I just want to give you the sense of how much work had to go into something like this to be able to represent the complexity of the genome in multiple sclerosis patients. What this is is just one region and how much evidence, how much additional evidence we're taking to, make, to mix statistics and biology to make weight for every single gene in the associated regions and come up with the most likely uh, biological culprit that is dysfunctional in that region that confers risk to MS. And what we did in addition is to create cell-specific maps because Genetics is the, the genome is the same for every cell type. The, the genes are exactly the same uh, for your T cells than for your uh, 
uh, hepatocytes, but the regulation of which gene is turned on or off changes from cell to cell. And that is a very delicate and still not completely understood mechanism. But we're trying to tap into information coming from very large projects such as an ENCODE and the NIH Epigenomic Roadmap Project in which we're trying to map the variants in the genome that can confer um, regulatory uh, changes to which gene turns on and off in which cell type. And when we mix that together with the risk for multiple sclerosis, we can come up with this cell-specific maps for risk of MS. And here we see a B cell risk map, a T cell risk map, a monocyte risk cell map, and a common module. So these are genes that appear to be active or appear to be uh, uh, modulated in a similar way across all different cell types. And the bottom line, the, one of the most perhaps important things that we can do with research like this is that we can create individualized profiles. So all what I've shown you so far is at the population level. But what about an individual? What about my cousin? What about my mom who has a mess? So how can I translate his or her risk into a particular map that, okay, your specific, your individual profile, this is where your risk comes from. And this is something that uh, we've been able to do. These are thousands of patients. Each of these little rows represents a patient. And each of the columns represents a particular gene in a region. And you can see that different individuals have very different risk profiles. The darker, the redder, the, uh, the mark, the more significant that is uh, for that person. Uh, and, and you can see that there are genes that some people have very little risk if they inherit this particular variant, and some people may have a very high risk. So that is very important to distinguish because different people may react different to different therapies based on their genetic profile. And this is just an, an example of how a particular cell-specific individualized profile can be used to determine what, where is your particular risk coming from for MS. So this is still work in progress. Uh, some of this was published uh, last year as part of the consortium uh, analysis, but this, is, this continues to be tested. And the goal eventually will be to uh, come up with an individualized risk profile that will inform what is the most likely therapy that this individual will be able to respond to. So let me switch now to the second part of the talk in which um, I mentioned that MS is part genes and part environments. And this slide is supposed to uh, help us with the transition. And the reason why we think about the environment is that um, the environment is everything that is not encoded in our genes. So you can think about the environment as the diet that we eat, things that we drink, uh, places where we live. And it's very difficult to measure systematically changes in the environment. But there is one window into the environment that can tell us and that contains a lot of information. And that is the microbes that live in our gut. As we all know, and I'm sure you are all aware by now, that human beings are composed of about 50% of human cells and 50% of bacteria. And most of those bacteria live in the guts. And they are the microflora that help us uh, digest food, among other things, but they help us also with a metabolic product. Some, some things we cannot produce and we rely on these bacteria to produce for us. 
And this uh, population uh, of bacterial organisms is extremely rich and extremely dynamic, and it changes with different environments. It changes with the, our diet, it changes whether we take a drug, whether we take an antibiotic, whether we uh, are traveling and so on. So it is a combination eventually. Uh, so the last thing that I wanna say about the microbiota is that it's extremely important in communicating with our immune system. So our microbiota and our immune system are in intimate contact. And in a sense, they are the go-betweens between the environment and our immune system. They tell us what's happening outside of the body. And so based on the microbiome, and microbiome represents the entirety of the genes encoded by these bacteria. In this figure, you can see that it is uh, it has been um, recently recognized that also changes in our gut microbiome are related to health and disease. What we still don't know is whether it's cause or consequence, and we'll get into that. But the assumption is that a healthy microbiome is a microbiome that, has, that is very diverse, that is uh, able to respond appropriately to uh, pathogens and eliminate them and is able to instruct our immune system in a positive way in combination with our own genes. So this is the, the, the plus sign and the human genome of, the, of that particular individual should result in a balanced immune response. Here represented very simplistically by a balanced Treg population and Th17 population. So these are two uh, blood cell types that um, are necessary. Their normal function is necessary to keep us a healthy immune system. And when they are in balance, uh, then there is no problem. However, changes in the microbiota can result in conjunction with our fixed genome. Our genome doesn't change might result in an imbalance of these immune responses. So in this case, for example, there's a overgrown of the yellow bacteria. So here, sorry, I did not uh, describe what we, you were seeing here. These blue cells here are the epithelium of the gut. So these are the cells that make up the walls of the intestine. On the inside or at the bottom, this is the immune cells. And here you see the T17 cells in red and the Treg cells in blue and other immune cells. And on the outside, so this is the lumen of the intestine, is the bacterial population. So when this dysbiosis happens, it could be because there's overgrowth of, let's say, the yellow bacteria, which stimulate more uh, T-Rex, then there's an imbalance. There's a, 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 a Th17 overgrown over T-Rex, and then we see the, uh, uh, an imbalanced immune system, which could lead to disease. Another sort of imbalance could happen because of depletion of the uh, green bacteria, which normally will stimulate the T-Rex. If there's not enough green bacteria, the T-Rex disappears. So there's again an imbalance towards relative more Th17 cells. And these are the cells that normally are associated with pro-inflammatory responses. So you can see how changes in the gut microbiota in combination with your own genome can result in an imbalance of immune responses and eventually over time lead to disease. So early on, uh, and this is work uh, that happened more than 10 years ago, uh, er early studies by the lab of Lloyd Casper showed that mice that were treated with antibiotics were resistant to EAE. So EAE is the animal experimental model of multiple sclerosis. So this was a fascinating uh, finding because it suggested strongly that bacteria in the gut are needed to mount an immune response. 
And this effect was associated with a decrease in inflammatory cytokines and an increase in interleukin-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, and a Treg population, again, an anti-inflammatory population of cells. So uh, another finding here that I want to highlight is that monocolonization with segmented filamentous bacteria. So this means when you have mice that are being depleted entirely from the microbiota and are then fed a single species, in this case, SFB, that was enough to restore TH17 responses and EAE susceptibility in germ-free mice. So mice depleted from microflora cannot mount an immune response. But if you feed them a single bacteria, not any bacteria, but segmented filamentous bacteria, that's enough to restore their immune competency. So this was uh, a very, very uh, uh, stimulating research because it, it, it really meant that that relationship between the gut bacteria and immune system uh, it was much, much more intimate than we originally thought. This is another experiment in which um, uh, our colleagues in the Max Planck Institute in Germany showed in a different model of uh, experimental model of, of multiple sclerosis. These are mice that uh, normally are genetically modified so that they, if you leave them alone for long enough, they will develop symptoms of multiple sclerosis hind leg paralysis, tail, a uh, flaxseed tail, and eventually paraparesis. But this will not happen if these mice are kept under germ-free conditions. This is the broken line here. So if these mice are kept under germ-free conditions, they will not get sick. Those who are kept in specific pathogen-free conditions, that means the regular barrier mice, they will get sick as time goes by. And an interesting experiment was that if you start with a germ-free mice and then feed them microbiota, that they start getting sick. So again, this is in the same line as the previous experiment, showing that how important microbiota is to uh, allow mounting of immune responses. So uh, a few years ago, uh, we in the lab started to make a, a very simple experiment um, with microbiota from patients with multiple sclerosis. All what I've shown so far was done in experimental animals. What uh, Egle, a very talented postdoc in the lab, did at the time was to collect stool samples from MS patients and from their healthy spouses. So these are individuals living in the same household, but one has a mass, the other doesn't. And purify their bacteria from stool, uh, kill the bacteria and mush them up, and culture them with their blood cells, with their autologous blood cells from the same donor. And then polarized, so grew the cells under Treg polarizing conditions, meaning selected a particular population from, from those blood cells and fostered their growth. And what we, sh what we uh, observed was that healthy individuals had a much healthier growth of the Treg population when in contact with their self bacteria than multiple sclerosis patients. And this was uh, very uh, novel at the time because it showed that there is something in the microbiota of MS patients that is impairing the development of these healthy Treg uh, population. Remember, the Tregs are the cells in your immune system that suppress inflammation. And what we're seeing is that in multiple sclerosis patients, because of the bacteria in their, in their guts, they're impairing the growth of these important cells. Now, the big, the big question was, okay, is this cause or consequence? So 
are these people getting MS because of the bacteria they have? And, and they pair Treg over time results in MS. Or are we seeing this because of the disease process? And that type of reverse causality uh, is, call, is called, is very difficult to address in anything that is non-genetic, right? So the only way that you can address this in an unequivocal form is if, if you say, well, the gene modifies the disease, the disease cannot modify your genes. But anything else, when we're talking about bacteria, that, that's a, a latent possibility. But the best way we had to um, address this was to transfer bacteria from MS patients, from, from gut, from, from stool, from MS patients into germ-free mice. So these are mice that have been grown in complete sterile conditions, no bacteria whatsoever. So they're colonized with MS microbiota. And another group of mice is colonized with healthy microbiota from the spouse. And then we see what happens when we induce EAE. And to our amazement, this is what happened. So the, the red curve shows the, how sick the animals receiving MS bacteria, bacteria from an MS patient, got over time. The blue curve shows that the animals receiving healthy bacteria got sick, but not nearly as much. Statistically significant difference. And these are mice which did not receive any bacteria, almost they didn't get sick at all. So this was a, a, a fairly strong proof that to the best of our abilities, we can say that perhaps bacteria do have a causal role in developing or perpetuating the disease. So another experiment that we perform also in collaboration with our colleagues in the Max Planck in Germany was that um, an experiment done in discordant MS twins. So these are monozygotic twins, but one of them has the disease and the other doesn't. So first we compare the microbiotas and these box plots show the similarity across pairs of individuals. So here where this is the distribution of how similar all pairs of twins are. So you can see that the higher, the, the, the y-axis represents how dissimilar samples are. So, and you see that the twins are the most similar. So it's the lowest of all the box plots. So any pair of twins have more similar microbiota than any non-pair of twins. And however we pair them up, either by cases or controls or unrelated, they're always more dissimilar than the twins. So this shows the genetic effect on the microbiome. But what we also uh, show is that when stool bacteria from a monozygotic twin was uh, fed into germ-free mice, they got very sick. And when stool bacteria from its monozygotic twin who's healthy was fed into germ-free mice, these mice did not get nearly as sick. And again, this is the exact same paradigm as I showed you before, but in a completely different scenario. Now, twins versus spouses. So again, more evidence suggesting that there is a risk that is carried by these patients which can be transmitted to germ-free mice. And this had to do with um, in a, a, a higher production of interleukin, uh, a lower production of interleukin 10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So I want to um, close my, my presentation today by describing um, our current efforts to try to map the uh, microbiome 
in multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, so this is uh, the International MS Microbiome Study. Um, this is a truly uh, international study uh, started at UCSF several years ago, but now uh, more than 10 sites around the world have joined. And the main goal is to try to understand how the microbial structure is altered in multiple sclerosis. What are the functions of those associated microbiota? And how we can uh, learn, what we can learn about the interactions between microbiota and the host so that we can eventually learn to modify it by modifying the behavior of the individual either by diet or by geography or by combination or by drugs and so on. And again, the, the main question that we're trying to ask is how is the gut microbiome shaped by confounding factors? So this is what we think happens, the, mic the gut microbiome might affect MS risk. However, there's a number of confounding factors that we need to eliminate, such as sex, age, diet, and so on. So how can we design a study, <coughs> excuse me, how can we design a study in which uh, these factors are taken into account and we're not mistakenly uh, attributing risk to the microbiome when in fact it is uh, the diet that is modifying the microbiome and, and not necessarily uh, um, the risk to MS. So the way that we design this study is as, as follows, and uh, I'm gonna show you here the first interim analysis of this when we collected 128 pairs of individuals. So for every case, for every patient, that we recruited, we recruited a household healthy control. And, and the reason why we chose household controls is that they share an environment, they share a house. So the risk is common. They're most likely eating the same or similar food. If they have children in the house, if they have pets in the house, if they live in a rural area or if they live in an urban area or next to an oil refinery, that will be accounted for, that will be common. So therefore, if there still are differences between the case and the control, those must be related to the disease, which is the factor that is still different. <coughs> so um, the way that we designed the study is we collected stool samples in different ways, different manners, technically uh, testing different kits, and uh, we also collected uh, uh, food questionnaires, so dietary questionnaires in all of them. We need to know what people are eating because we know that diet is a major modifier of the microbiota. And then we perform genetic analysis on the DNA of those uh, bacterial populations to understand how diverse and who's there, and then try to link that with the presence or absence of the disease and to try to eliminate as many confounding factors as possible. This is a breakdown of our um, study. We have uh, uh, patients recruited uh, in San Francisco, Boston, New York, Buenos Aires, and Edinburgh. And uh, the distribution by uh, sex uh, represents uh, for pretty much um, uh, the MS uh, distribution. Um, there's no difference in age, uh, uh, BMI, uh, or any other um, characteristic. So one of the uh, first things that we did is we performed two types of genetic analysis in these samples. We measured the 16S ribosomal RNA content and, and variability. And we also sequence the entire genome of the bacteria. So these are two different methods to identify the genetic material of bacteria. One of them is a more screen-based tool and the other is more in-depth. But both of them gave us similar results and their correlation is fairly good. And it doesn't matter where we look at the phylum level, which is at the top of the tree of life, if you remember that, 
or the genus level, which is way back close to the species level, which would be the most uh, um, discriminatory uh, level. So we still see a fairly similar um, um, distribution of, uh, of, of, of genera in this uh, bacteria, and there's a good correlation between the two methods. But of course, uh, we uncover more taxa by looking at the whole genome than we do looking at the 16S ribosomal RNA. This is uh, by design. Uh, you're looking at more genetic material. But one of the interesting aspects that we uh, wanted to test in this first study because there's so little research has been done, we needed to start from the very, very beginning. And first of all, are there differences in the microbiome that are related to the way that we're collecting the samples? So one of our test kits uh, was using a Q-tip, for example, to obtain the sample. And the other was uh, just a, a scoop of, of stool. So in these two different ways, do we see significant differences in the, in the way that uh, the results are coming? And the response is, well, not really. We don't see any statistically significant difference. The majority, overwhelming majority of the difference comes from subject to subject. So this is again a plot showing how different samples are when we contrast them by different subjects. And for comparison, this is how different samples are if we compare the acquisition method. So the Q-tip or the solid stool, you see how little difference that makes in terms of uh, finding differences. And we also tested samples at two different times. So individuals provided a stool sample uh, one day and then a few days later, just to see if there was any temporal uh, shifts in the composition of the microbiome, and we didn't see that any, uh, at least within a week. So the majority of the differences were due to different individuals. So the microbiomes of different individuals is overwhelmingly more different than any method that we have to measure. And another interesting aspect is that the inter-individual variation was related to geographical distance. What that means is that uh, there is a statistical significant difference when we measure pairs of individuals within the same site, meaning the same city, or across cities. So and that is true whether we only look at healthy controls or only look at multiple sclerosis patients. We always see a more similar <coughs> um, microbiome profile when individuals are taken from the same city. And this again has to do with all those intangibles that make up geographical differences. When we add house into that equation, of course we see a much more, well of course, but it was nice to see, that was the hypothesis. But this represents how much more similar individuals uh, are, that their microbiomes are, if they come from the same house. So this is a very strongly statistically significant difference. If you are from the same house, much more similar than if they're from different houses in the same city, and they are in turn more similar than if compared to individuals from different cities. And that also um, was true if we stratify individuals by the type of disease. Uh, healthy controls, relapse remitting individuals, or even individuals with primary progressive MS, that did not alter the results. So it's showing again that household pairs are much more similar because of a shared environment. And here is another way of showing uh, the data, showing that this tells you what other variables are important in determining a different microbiome. So house is the most relevant of them all. Recruiting site, so city, is the second most important. And then you have others that are dwarfing in terms of significance and magnitude, but there are still statistically significant, such as age, 
body mass index and uh, all the others are not statistically significant. But geography also shows a dominant influence on diet. So this is now showing how much more similar the diets are, not the microbiomes, but because remember that we know what people are eating in our study. So now we're comparing diet similarity and look at the, at the similar plots. We see exactly the same or pretty much exactly the same. If individuals are from the same house, they eat a more similar diet. If they're from the same house, but the, the different house, but the same city, their diets is more similar than if they are from different cities. And again, if we start looking at what are the variables that determine their, what are the most important variables determining the similarity in their diets, the single most important factor is the house. So with this, I would like to just uh, wrap up and um, uh, go back to some take home uh, uh, messages that I would like uh, you to, uh, to go away with. First is that mapping uh, genetic associations is only the first step in trying to understand a complex disease architecture such as MS. So all these GWAS genetic association studies are the first but necessary step to try to understand the biology. Additional studies are now being conducted to try to understand the biology and how this could be used to, to predict risk of individuals if that's ever possible or to guide a tailored therapeutic approaches for the individual. And pathway analysis is one such strategy that we in the lab have developed. Um, and uh, this pathway specific uh, analysis uh, involves integration of genetic associations, as I mentioned, with gene regulatory information in order to provide a cell specific risk. Then on the second part of the talk, I talk about how the gut microbiome might be involved in MS pathogenesis. I've shown you uh, the important results from animals and from uh, uh, humans in which it appears that diet is a major driver of the microbiome and in turn the microbiome could be a driver of disease susceptibility. Um, I also shown some technical aspects of this study that uh, is uh, now in press in the MS journal, showing that stool sample collection methods have a little uh, uh, significance in terms of um, the microbial structure, and that the unique household case control design of the IMSMS has been shown to reduce confounding variables, and it maximizes the power of such studies. So we are now in the process of uh, analyzing a much, much larger cohort of patients, uh, uh, five times larger, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to share results of this in uh, next year's uh, presentation at the CMSC. So with this, I would like to thank all the people who participated uh, in this uh, studies, uh, people from my lab, people from the uh, UCSF MS Center, our collaborators both at, at UCSF, at the International MS Genetic, uh, Genetics Consortium, and uh, the IMSMS colleagues all around the world. I'll also like to acknowledge uh, funding, Valhalla Charitable Foundation, the National MS Society, Department of uh, Defense, the National Institutes of Health, and the International Progressive MS Alliance. With this, uh, thank you so much for your attention and I'll see you next time.